we'll give it another two minutes. Usually everybody clicks on the button at noon. Okay, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alberto Rossi, Associate Professor of Finance and Associate Director of the Center for Financial Markets and Policy at Georgetown. Uh, welcome back to our seminar series on FinTech. I hope you had a good break and we're very happy to restart the series for 2021, hoping that it will be a better year than 2020. Uh, before we get started, let me take a moment to thank Reena Agarwal, John Jacobs, and especially Anna Karmis from the Center for Financial Markets and Policy. And today um, is going to be AI and Asset Management Day. We have three great papers applying machine learning techniques to study equity and bond prices. So without further ado, let me just leave the floor or the virtual floor to Turan Bali, who is going to be presenting the first paper. The title is The Cross-Sectional Pricing of Corporate Bonds Using Big Data and Machine Learning. Um, as a reminder, Turan will talk uh, uninterrupted for 20 to 25 minutes. We will then have five to 10 minutes for questions. You can raise your hand or write your questions in the chat. Uh, Turan's co-authors are in the audience most likely, so they may be able to answer some of the questions in the chat on the fly. And um, if you don't mind, uh, please uh, turn on your camera as this makes the experience much more engaging for everyone. Turan, I'll leave the floor to you. Oh, thanks, Alberto. Uh, this is a joint work with my co-authors, uh, Amit, Dashan, Fuwei, and Kwan. Um, as Alberto mentioned, they are in the audience to answer tough questions. Uh, I am here to take the blame for weakness of our paper. Uh, let me start with uh, the motivation and explain why we are interested in the corporate bond market and uh, machine learning models. Uh, over the past half century or since the early 1970s, uh, a substantial number of stock characteristics have been identified as significant predictors of stock returns, future stock returns in the cross section. Uh, however, recently or over the past few years, uh, this vast literature has been criticized by um, Cam Harvey and his co-authors, Harvey et al. and Ho et al. and among, among others. And all these papers have legitimate concerns uh, about data mining, data snooping, um, p-hacking, correlate multiple testing, and so on. So uh, identifying um, a robust and economically sensible uh, stock return predictor uh, becomes an important task in asset pricing. Uh, to address these concerns, um, Brian and his co-authors, uh, Gu, Kelly, and Shu, um, in their uh, well-cited article in the RFS 2020, they show that machine learning models are able to generate robust forecasting power to predict stock returns in the cross-section and time series. So these models also help us identify which stock characteristics perform better. So it also helps us for identification purposes. So despite uh, this vast literature and the vast reproduction of stock characteristics or factors or risk measures and liquidity measures out there to explain the predictability of stock returns, uh, we argue that far less has been done so far uh, to understand the determinants of bond returns. This is our, one of our motivations. So this is an under-investigated, under-studied literature. I'm referring to corporate bonds per se. And in this paper, uh, we provide the first comprehensive study on the cross-sectional predictability of bond returns using big data and machine learning. 
Uh, but but uh, with, with big data, what I mean is not just uh, borrowing uh, 94 stock characteristics from Green et al, uh, which is widely used. Uh, we build the first, we develop the first data library of uh, bond characteristics. We have a total of 43 bond characteristics relying on past studies and some new characteristics we develop in this paper. So we are going to use uh, both bond characteristics and stock characteristics and predict future stock returns and bond returns, although our objective is uh, to predict uh, or investigate the predictability of bond returns, we are trying to disentangle the sources of return predictability for bonds and equities. And we rely on uh, Gu et al. paper uh, on machine learning models. We have a total of eight machine learning methods, uh, PCA, PLS, dimension reduction, reduction models, and we have uh, lasso, rich, elastic net, uh, regression trees, random forests, and we have two neural network models to capture long memory effect. And then eventually, uh, we basically take uh, the average of these individual expected return forecasts from these machine learning models. So our objective is basically uh, to uh, replicate, in a way, uh, Brian's RFS paper for corporate bond returns, but then explain what is the source of return predictability in those two markets, bonds and equities. So why are we interested in the corporate bond market? Aside from the fact that corporate bonds are under investigated, uh, this market has increased substantially over time in terms of size and liquidity. For example, the size of this market uh, was around $1.7 trillion in 1990, and now it's around $13, $14 trillion. So we are talking about average uh, annual growth rate of 8%. And also trading volume has increased. And more importantly, we are trying to understand uh, the risk and return characteristics of the portfolios of institutional investors, because there is this large segmentation between the two markets, equity versus bond markets. Uh, so let me go back to the previous slide and explain why uh, bond and equities should be investigated uh, thoroughly, because um, some of us may think that these two markets are fully integrated and bond, bond characteristics and stock characteristics may contain similar information so that uh, their predictive power shouldn't differ much in terms of predicting future returns, uh, stock returns, or bond returns. So, I mean, based on Merton 1974, the seminal article in JF, uh, who comes up with this no arbitrage relation for bonds and equities, we know an equity is a long call, bond is a short put on the firm's asset, but he makes a number of assumptions uh, to generate that no arbitrage relation. And the hedge ratio breaks down. It's simply because, uh, for example, all investors, his assumptions do not hold in practice, but one of his assumptions, especially like all investors are symmetrically informed, that doesn't hold because we know corporate bond market is dominated by uh, institu sophisticated institutional investors, mainly insurance companies, pension funds, and mutual funds. Whereas, uh, Retail investors, I don't want to call them naive, but less sophisticated retail investors uh, play a major role in the equity market, as we have seen a few days ago, right, with GameStop uh, and a few other stuff. So, so basically, our, uh, one of the bullet points that we uh, basically pay attention to is, uh, is investor clientele. So these investors have different risk appetites. They have, they have different investment objectives. They have different investment horizons. For example, bondholders have longer investment horizons, right? So this brings this heterogeneity in the investment, uh, in investor heterogeneity, I'm sorry, heterogeneity in the information sets and preferences across the two markets. Also, shorting costs as well as liquidity levels are significantly different across the two asset classes. Uh, that suggests arbitrage frictions. And finally, um, equity and bondholders, uh, these investors are subject to different regulatory capital and funding liquidity constraints. So for all these reasons, uh, we emphasize the existence of significant disintegration between equity and bond markets. That's why stock characteristics and bond characteristics may contain different information to predict future stock and bond returns. Okay, this is one of our uh, motivations. So why machine learning methods? Well, um, several reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, a series of papers by, by Geert Beckhardt and others emphasize time varying risk aversion and aversion to economic uncertainty. So that basically relates expected returns. That makes expected returns as a nonlinear function of risk and risk aversion. So that brings the concept of nonlinearity and hidden relationships. That's why uh, we argue that uh, standard linear models such as OLS will not be able to capture these nonlinearities. So machine learning models uh, potentially will, that's our hypothesis at least, um, 
before I show in tables, machine learning models will be able to capture these nonlinearities. Also, these two different groups of investors, retail versus, uh, let's say, uh, institutional investors, they might differ in their sensitivity to risk factors. For example, compared to stockholders, uh, bondholders are more sensitive to downside risk. Okay, and standard linear models may not be able to detect the concave payoff functions in corporate bonds. And also, these sophisticated institutional investors they frequently use dynamic trading strategies with nonlinear payoffs, due to their frequent use of short selling leverage and derivatives. So that's why uh, we believe, we hypothesize, we conjecture that machine learning models will be able to capture these nonlinearities in the data. All right. So, uh, and I would say uh, one of our major contributions to the literature, especially after Brian's paper, who has done a lot already on, uh, on the stock return predictability part, we are trying to uh, explain or provide an explanation to different sources of pred predictability. So uh, as I will show you at the end of the presentation, uh, we identify uh, stock characteristics as cash flow predictors. And uh, bond characteristics largely predict uh, discount rate news component of bond returns. So there is this decomposition, okay? Uh, and also um, we basically find that stock return predictability is largely driven by mispricing, which is not unusual because Retail investors have uh, significant or strong uh, psychological and behavioral biases, whereas bond return predictability is largely driven by risk. So there is this risk versus mispricing hypothesis testing at the end of the paper, and also the cross-section return predictability is driven by cash flow news component of stock returns for the stock return predictability, whereas uh, bond return predictability is driven by discount rate channel. All right, so in interest of time, I won't have basically uh, have time to go over uh, the literature uh, in detail, the data, but the setup is, is, is basically borrowed from uh, Gu et al. Uh, as I said before, uh, we have eight machine learning models running against the OLS, and then we have the combination method. So what is our performance metric? Uh, we rely on the out of sample R square. And uh, we use uh, Clark and West 2007 Journal of Econometrics article uh, to get the statistical significance of these R square measures. We use the first years, uh, first three years, I'm sorry, uh, of estimation as our estimation period. The following two years is the validation. And then the final, the last 12 years is our out of sample period. Uh, for pairwise comparisons, for pay, uh, to test pairwise uh, predictive accuracy of these models, alternative models, we rely on uh, DM statistic, Debold, Frank Debold's, uh, the JBS 1995 article, Debold and Mariana statistics, and uh, we basically compare uh, the forecast error differentials, okay? All right, so let me, okay, the, the, fine. maybe I should say uh, briefly something on the trace data. Uh, so our data is coming from trace. Um, the sample period is July 2002, December 2017. We have a total of 1.2 million bond month return observations for 23,000 bonds issued uh, by 6, 000, approximately 6,000 unique firms. 75% of our sample are investment grade, the remaining 25% are high yield. Uh, okay, I will talk about this later. Maybe I should just jump to uh, the first main table. So the paper has, uh, I would say, two uh, big empirical sections. Uh, the first section uh, focuses on uh, the cross-sectional return predictability of bond returns. The second part uh, looks at stock return predictability. And the final section talks about the sources of return predictability. So the first section, this is our first main table. We are basically looking at cross-sectional return predictability of bond returns using bond characteristics only. So here we are only using bond characteristics, the 43 bond characteristics that we developed for this paper. So as you can see, the first column, these are out of sample R squares. Uh, we didn't put any stars, but uh, the machine learning models generated all these positive and highly significant, at least at the 1% level or better, uh, R square statistics uh, for machine learning models. But the first column shows that OLS fails to deliver significant out of sample forecasting power. Machine learning models significantly improve and, and this result is basically uh, similar more or less for investment grade and non-investment grade bonds. We, we can see, if you look at the last row, we observe slightly higher return predictability in terms of the magnitude of R squares. It's just because um, the distributional characteristics of non-investment grade bonds 
they are more volatile, they are they are, they are more skewness and uh, non-linearity is a little bit more severe compared to investment grade ones. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is okay. So when we compare, uh, uh, when we have, uh, when we compare the alternative model, these are basically pairwise comparisons. In this table, as you can see, the bold stats are DM statistics. They are all significant. That means OLS is rejected in favor of the machine learning models. Okay, when we look at the pairwise comparison of the machine learning model, there is no clear winner, as you can see. Okay, I mean, you can speculate on the magnitude of the DM statistics for Ridge versus Lasso. But the last column tells us something. Uh, the combination method that averages all these individual average return forecasts, right? So as you can see, Lasso, Ridge, and ENET, those three plus LSTM, they are rejected in favor of the combination method if you are trying to search which one performs better. And FFN seems to be a uh, clear winner uh, also going forward. Uh, RF also, but when I talk about the economic significance, FFN seems to be doing even better on the economic significance. Uh, let me show you uh, those results. Okay, which correct? So this is also important, but I unfortunately I don't have time to dig into uh, the most influential bond characteristics. So I try to summarize all these figures because um, Basically, the significance of the, those 43 bond characteristics differ somewhat across different estimation methods, as you can predict. But uh, if I summarize uh, characteristics related to liquidity risk, downside risk, and systematic risk, they are the clear winners among the 43 bond characteristics. And they are consistently improving the performance of OLS across these eight or nine machine learning models. Uh, and this makes sense. Uh, this is actually in line with our final find that I'm going to talk about, bond return predictability is largely driven by risk, not anything related to mispricing or behavioral factors, okay? All right, so what about economic significance of our findings? Um, so this is uh, the standard setting in asset pricing literature and also Brian's paper. Uh, we basically sort uh, individual bonds into long short portfolios. Uh, these are decile portfolios. Low means uh, this is the portfolio that you are going to short. This is the short level of the portfolio with low expected uh, return forecast. Uh, high is the portfolio. This is the long level of the portfolio, this IL-10, in which uh, these are our, basically, these are the bonds we expect they are going to perform better in the future. So if you look at the first row, this is the uh, basically the bond uh, OLS forecasts using bond characteristics only. So as you can see, when we sort bonds based on the OLS forecasts, the average return spread uh, is only 16 basis points per month. When I say average return spread, I'm talking about once we for, uh, sort these bonds into desired portfolios, we calculate one month ahead realized returns of those bonds. So this is the average realized, uh, one month ahead average realized returns. It's only 16 basis points per month. And the T statistic, these are the newest T statistics in parentheses. Uh, it's just only point, point 0.98. So OLS does not deliver economically large or statistically significant return spreads. But when you look at the machine learning models, they are consistently delivering economically large, approximately, let's say, 55 basis points till 97 basis points for return spread. And they are all highly significant. And as I said before, FFN seems to be doing well here compared to other uh, machine learning models. And this result is pretty much the same when we replicate this table for investment grade bonds or high yield bonds. Okay, OLS again does not perform but machine learning models constantly generate uh, economically large and highly significant return spreads in the arbitrage portfolios, okay? All right, so uh, now what about stock characteristics? Uh, so the next step is to um, investigate whether stock characteristics add any incremental predictive power to bond characteristics in predicting future bond returns. I am still in the bond return predictability, okay? I didn't move to stock return predictability yet. So we are just trying to investigate whether stock characteristics uh, perform uh, well with machine learning models and if they add anything uh, significant to bond characteristics. So in the first table, as you can see, again, OLS didn't perform, uh, but machine learning models generate positive and significant in most cases, uh, uh, significant return predictability. But if you look at the magnitude of R squares, the out of sample R squares from bond characteristics are somewhat higher than those we obtained from stock characteristics, okay? And they also generate um, significant return spreads. But when we compare the incremental predictive power of stock characteristics, unfortunately, they didn't do well. So they don't really add any significant incremental predictive power 
to bond characteristics. So there is this segmentation. Stock characteristics alone, they predict future bond returns. But when we combine them, 43 bond characteristics plus 94 stock characteristics, stock characteristics do not add much to the predictability of future bond returns. This is the main takeaway from this table. Okay. Uh, let me see. Oops. Okay, and then uh, I move now to the second piece of uh, the paper. This is basically predicting future stock returns. This is uh, basically replicating uh, Brian's paper in the RFS article. Uh, uh, this, but the sample period is different, of course. Our main findings are identical, uh, but uh, the qu quantitatively we have some, a little bit differences because of the sample period we cover. Their sample period is longer. We have 2002, 2017, but the main finding is there. Uh, both stock characteristics and bond characteristics alone, they do predict, they improve the predictive performance of the OLS. So machine learning models significantly improve the performance. And when we form uh, portfolios, uh, long short portfolios of individual stocks this time, uh, OLS again generate a statistically insignificant return spreads, whereas machine learning models consistently generate economically large and highly significant return spreads. But I must say that the return spreads are somewhat smaller uh, in the stock return predictability. I'm sorry, uh, it's a little bit larger in the stock return predictability as expected. Okay. Uh, then, uh, then we investigate uh, whether bond characteristics add uh, incrementally to the predictive power of stock characteristics. So here results are similar to what I showed you before. Unfortunately, the bond characteristics, uh, incremental uh, predictive power of bond characteristics is really small here. Uh, I don't want to get into the details, but when you compare them, stock characteristics tend to predict future stock returns better than bond characteristics or vice versa, all right? So what is the source of return predictability? This is the section I really like. Um, so we are trying to run two big tests here. Uh, we are trying to disentangle the source of return predictability. The first test relies on the Campbell-Schiller decomposition. So we use uh, return on assets and Tobin's Q for return decomposition for individual bonds and stocks. And once we decompose bond returns and stock returns into their discount rate and cash flow news components. Uh, so there are too many numbers here, but in interest of time, let me try to summarize. Uh, so here um, you can see the discount rate news component of bond returns is predicted by bond characteristics and stock characteristics. But again, stock characteristics do not add much to the predictive power of bond characteristics. So essentially what we are saying is, and they are actually poor, both bond and stock characteristics, uh, they perform very poorly in predicting the cash flow of news component of bond returns. So the main takeaway is uh, bond characteristics are largely uh, discount rate predictors. They predict uh, discount rate news component of bond returns. So when we replicate this for stock return predictability, so as you can see in the first panel, uh, stock characteristics are very successful in predicting the cash flow of news component of stock returns. They do a reasonable job in predicting uh, discount rate news, but largely the stock return predictable is coming from the cash flow of news component. Okay, and again, uh, bond characteristics do not add much to the predictive power of uh, stock characteristics in predicting either discount rate or cash flow of news component of stock returns. So the final set of analysis are based on uh, testing uh, two competing hypotheses. Is it risk or mispricing? All right, so let me get to the test, the main test. So the first set of tests are based on uh, testing the risk, risk hypothesis. So these are double sorts now. So the first panel are bivariate, uh, or I should say independent double sorts. Uh, first sort individual bonds, the first panel, we sort individual bonds into uh, ratings downgrade quantiles, or you may want to call it uh, changes in credit risk. Okay, so the low uh, change in rating means relatively low change in credit risk. High change in rating means large ratings downgrade. Okay, and then we sort bonds also based on uh, the one month ahead expected return forecasts. These these forecasts are coming from now from the combination method. Okay, so this table is specifically uh, double sorts five by five based on ratings downgrade and expect return forecasts generated by the combination model. 
So as you can see, the last two columns, uh, we have pervasive bond return predictability, large return spreads, highly significant for all quantiles of ratings downgrade. But there's a significant difference between uh, low ratings change and high ratings change. So we are talking about 32 basis point return spread for bonds with low ratings downgrade. And we are talking about nine, approximately 77 basis points per month return spread for bonds with large ratings downgrade. And, and, and the return spreads are increasing almost monotonically. And when we do the diff and diff test, uh, the difference is about 45 basis points per month. So these results indicate that ratings downgrade results in a, a negative price response followed by higher future returns. So basically, this is our risk story for bond return predictability based on the uh, ratings downgrade and expected return forecast. And when we replicate this for stock portfolios, so now these are the one month ad uh, expected return forecast of individual stocks using stock characteristics only. Double sort based on ratings downgrade or changes in credit ratings and uh, stock return forecast. So as you can see, there is significant return spread, smaller, but the diff and diff test does not yield significant difference in return spread. So it's only 35 basis points versus 52 basis points. The spread of the spread is only 17 basis points per month and insignificant. So that's why stock return predictability is not driven by ratings downgrade. Okay, our final table, with that I will conclude, I promise. Uh, so this is the mispricing test. Uh, so we rely on Stambo Yu Yuan uh, 2015 JF article. So we are using their mispricing score. They generate this mispricing score for individual stocks using 11 stock return predictors. High mispricing score means overvaluation. Low mispricing score means undervaluation. So we sort individual stocks this time based on their mispricing score from low to high. So these are low undervalued, these are overvalued stocks. And the mid quantile contains stocks that we can call relatively fairly uh, priced. Okay, so these are fairly valued stocks, I should say. So as you can see, there is significant stock return predictability. Uh, and these are basically, again, one month ahead return forecasts from the combination method using stock characteristics only, okay? So we have significant return predictability, significant uh, return spread for undervalued stocks, 72 basis points, and overvalued stocks. But if you look at fairly valued stocks, there is no stock return predictability. The return spread is only four basis points, and the T-stat is 0.07. So and when, when we do the diff and diff tests uh, between overvalued stocks versus fairly valued stocks, or undervalued stocks versus fairly valued stocks, diff and diff tests generate significant return spreads. So this is this table, the first panel, clearly shows that uh, stock return predictability is largely driven by mispricing, okay? Not by risk, as I present in the previous panel. And we replicate this for individual bonds. Again, bond return forecasts generated by the combination and the mispricing score. As you can see, there is no significant return spreads for undervalued versus fairly valued or overvalued versus fairly valued. So there is no mispricing. There is, mispricing doesn't have any strong influence over bond return predictability. Uh, so basically, uh, let me conclude. Uh, I think time is up already. Uh, so our main conclusion is cross-sectional return predictability in bonds is driven by discount rate news component. Stock return predictability is driven by cash flow news component. So stock characteristics is cash flow predictors. And uh, bond return predictability is largely driven by risk, whereas stock return predictability is largely driven by mispricing. So with that, I conclude. Thank you so much, Duran, for the fantastic presentation. We have a question from Marcus Pelger. Marcus, yeah. you can unmute yourself and talk. Thank you so much for the great presentation, Duran. Very nice paper. Um, I have just three quick comments, questions. One is about the connection between stocks and bonds. Yeah. I understand your argument that the markets might be segmented, but I still think under normal conditions, a bond and stock returns are connected. And it would definitely be interesting if you would impose as a penalty um, this put call type uh, relationship and sure. see how the results would differ. Um, okay. And okay. I would assume because of the high noise in this type of data, you might actually get better results. Mm -hmm. Number two is about R squared as a measure. Um, I mean, we all know that for stocks at least, um, the level is very hard to predict, but relative performance seems to be more predictable. Mm -hmm. Now you can get very bad R squared numbers uh, because you get the level wrong, but you get the relative ranking right. 
And that is kind of hidden if you report these R squared numbers here. So it could be interesting to show all results in terms of relative performance, how well you predict that. You do it partially by your long short factors or yeah, portfolios, we do, we do. but you could do it for all the results. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Number three, um, um, as you know very well, there are a lot of tuning parameters when you deal with these type of machine learning methods right. and the results depend on tuning parameters. And one thing that um, I noticed was that your elastic net was doing almost always worse than either Rich or Lasso. Yes. Those are special cases and in a correctly specified model, they shouldn't be better. And you know, that means you might want to be quite careful about the whole tuning parameter selection process. Okay, okay. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Well taken, yeah. Yeah, so I think uh, um, we have, uh, yeah, we are perfectly right on time actually for the next paper. Um, Marcus uh, is going to be presenting the next paper and uh, the okay. title yeah. is uh, Deep Learning in Asset Pricing. And um, uh, Marcus, take it away, you have 25 minutes. Alberto, thank you so much for including me here in the program. This is joint work with my PhD students, Lu Yang Chen and Jason Su, both from Stanford University. So in this paper, we want to tackle one of the most important questions in asset pricing, namely understanding why do we observe different expected returns for different assets. We know the answer to this question is the exposure to systematic risk as measured by a stochastic discount factor, so we should observe different expected returns because assets have a different exposure to this SDF. Now, the big question is now to estimate this SDF. So the title of today's session is Asset Management, and I just want to highlight that asset pricing and um, investment are just two sides of the same coin because this SDF portfolio will actually be a mean variance efficient portfolio. So it will be an attractive investment opportunity. And if I have an asset pricing model, I can, um, identify under or overpriced assets. And obviously this also maps into investment strategies. Okay, so the question is to estimate the SDF, but that is a challenging problem for a number of reasons. So first, um, the SDF should depend on all available economic information. And that means there are a lot of variables and have a big data problem. Number two, there's no reason that the functional form of this relationship should be simple like linear. So it can be complex as uh, Turan has pointed out in his work and Brian as well. Number three, um, dynamic should matter. For example, the exposure to risk and the price of risk during a boom can be different than during a time of a recession. And somehow we need to incorporate these dynamics. Now, can machine learning methods help? And when I talk about machine learning methods, I refer to methods that are flexible in terms of their functional form. So they're non-parametric and they can deal with many variables because there's some form of regularization. Now, the issue is that um, if you look at stock returns, we have a relatively uh, low signal to noise ratio. As Brian has shown in his work, depending on the data and the methods that you use, less than 1% of stock returns is predictable, but this predictable part is exactly where the risk premium is and that's what we care about for asset pricing. And now what we do in this paper, we include economic structure more specifically, a no arbitrage condition. And we show that this helps to push up the signal in the data and to detect a more meaningful economic model. Now, before I go into the model, I want to highlight three key challenges that we have to deal with in asset pricing and how we solve those. Number one is what is the SDF and how does it depend on my information set? So very popular models are linear factor models. Um, very well known is the Pharma French five factor model. This assumes that the SDF is a linear function of five factors. And for the Pharma French five factor model, the SDF depends only on size, book to market, investment and profitability characteristic information. Now, the linear form is likely misspecified and there are hundreds of potential characteristics to predict returns. So what we are doing in this paper, we have a very general framework that allows us to estimate what is the functional form, it doesn't need to be linear. And we can also make statements about what are the relevant variables to span the SDF. Number two is a very important problem. Unfortunately, it has not received the attention it should in the literature, and that's about test assets. So I need test assets to evaluate which asset pricing model is good or bad, and I also need to calibrate an asset pricing model. Very popular test assets are the 25 pharma French portfolios, double sorted on size and um, book to market ratio. The issue is if I have an asset pricing model that can price those 25 test assets, it doesn't mean that it's going to work on other test assets. So what we argue in this paper is 
that if you want to calibrate an asset price model, you should use all stocks and any possible characteristics or portfolios that you can get with these stocks. And we do this in a data-driven way. Number three is about dynamics. So booms or recession should have an effect on asset pricing, for example. Now, one way to incorporate that is to use NBR recession indicators, potentially interacted with other variables. Now, the issue is that we have hundreds of macroeconomic time series with very complex dynamics. And so there should be more information that we can use. And so what we are going to do here is to extract from a large dimensional panel of macroeconomic time series, a small number of economic states that are relevant for asset pricing. All right, so this paper is about estimating the SDF with deep neural networks. And the key innovation is to use a no arbitrage objective function to do this estimation. Actually, we are not going to have one neural network, but our model has three different neural networks and each is going to tackle one of the challenges that I've outlined before. There will be one neural network that estimates the SDF as a function of my information set. There will be a second neural network that extracts the economic states that I can condition my SDF on. And there will be a third neural network that generates informative test assets that I need to calibrate my asset pricing model on. And these three neural networks are glued together by a no arbitrage condition. Just want to highlight, this is a very general model, which includes essentially all other models as a special case. So what are the findings? So first, empirically, our framework seems to work really well. And I will only talk about out of sample results here. And when I mean it works well, I talk, mean what is the sharp ratio that our SDF can achieve out of sample, which is 2.6 for 25 years out of sample, which is much higher than the other benchmark models we consider. We can explain 8% of the variation in individual stock returns. And if you look at conventional test assets, and I, these are portfolio sorts, we get uh, cross-sectional R squares higher than 90% for all possible test assets that we look at. So it seems to work really, really well, but we can also learn something about the structure of the SDF. So first, it seems that um, Nonlinearities do not matter that much if you look at asset pricing, if you look at characteristics in isolation. So there seems to be a reason why linear factor models are so successful. However, if you look at uh, the interaction between characteristics, that's where the nonlinearities come in. To put it simple, small stocks are different from small value stocks, and the interaction between size and value is a nonlinear interaction. It matters to include macroeconomic conditions. And once you do it, you get a very stable asset pricing model. We can also make statements about what are the variables that matter the most for asset pricing. Now, if there's one takeaway of my talk today is that economic conditions matter if you want to use machine learning methods. For the task of asset pricing, it seems that if you use a linear model that includes economic structure in the form of a no arbitrage objective function, it can do better if you use off the shelf prediction method. However, if you combine the flexibility of machine learning with economic insights, you can get a very powerful model framework that can capture a lot of economic structure. I just want to briefly highlight the literature here. Um, um, so there's one part of the literature that relates to what Turan just presented. I think the most important paper there is a pioneering work by Brian. And this literature has shown that machine learning methods um, are very helpful for finance and um, non-linearities and regularization is important when it comes to predicting returns. Now this literature is taking more or less off the shelf methods and is not including an economic structure per se. There's another part of the literature and this literature typically looks at more um, constrained functional forms, typically linear models, but uses a large number of linear factors, for example, but then uses economic structure to find an SDF. And this literature has shown that including this kind of economic structure will help to get better asset pricing models. Now, what I'm going to do today is I will combine the flexibility of machine learning with an economic structure. And I will show that this will bring us a lot of benefits in estimating an SDF model. And here I build on insights that Brian has already um, uh, shown in one of his papers where he also combined machine learning models with some economic structure to get better factor models. 
All right, let me start now with a model framework. So I care about excess returns. That means returns minus the risk free rate of different stocks. And if I multiply those with an SDF, which I denote by M, the conditional expected value should be zero. That's a fundamental no arbitrage condition. Um, now note that if I take a variable that I can observe at time T, that means a measurable um, a random variable at time T, um, I can create unconditional moment equations. Now, no arbitrage essentially just implies an infinite number of unconditional moment equations. Now, what I want to get, what I want to estimate is an SDF. And without a lot of generality, I can project um, my SDF on the return space. So what I want to estimate is a portfolio of all stock returns with time varying portfolio weights, where these portfolio weights can be functions of my information set. Now we'll split my information set into macroeconomic information that could be inflation rates, GDP growth, et cetera, and firm specific characteristic, size, value, momentum, past returns. And so my SDF weights are general nonlinear functions of a large number of variables. Now from standard textbook arguments, we know that this conditional no arbitrage equation is equivalent to one factor model where I have my SDF, I have an SDF beta, which is time varying because it's a function of my general information set. And so what I want to do is I want to estimate my SDF weights. That gives me an SDF. Then I can get SDF betas. And once I have those, I can do asset pricing. For example, at each point in time, I can run a cross-sectional regression on my time varying betas to get a residual. And then I can analyze my asset pricing um, results. So how are we going to do the estimation? So let's say I have fixed a conditioning function G. So a conditioning function G is just applied to my information set that I use to generate these unconditional moments. So let's say I fix that. Then I can look at sample moments and I do a classical general method of moment estimation to get my SDF. Now the twist here is that I use feed forward neural networks to estimate my SDF to explain all these sample moments for a given conditioning variable. Now the next step is important, so please pay attention. If I take excess returns and I multiply them with a conditioning variable, I essentially form characteristic managed portfolios. One example would be a G that is an indicator function that is one if I have small cap stocks and zero otherwise. In that case, I form characteristic managed portfolios that are small cap stocks. So choosing conditioning function is the same as forming test assets or choosing instruments for a GMM problem, right? So by choosing my conditioning function, I choose which test assets I want to price with my asset pricing model. Now, the issue here is that I have an infinite number of candidate choices for my instruments or test assets, and I need to find a criterion to select those. We are going to do this with a generative adversarial network approach. So let's say I've chosen my test assets G, then I will try to find an SDF that minimizes the pricing errors for these test assets. Now I will actually have two networks. I will introduce an adversarial or conditional network that plays a zero sum game with my SDF network. Given an estimated SDF, I'm trying to generate test assets that my asset pricing model cannot explain yet. And now I will have an iterative game. So given these new test assets, I want to improve my SDF to explain those as well. Now, what I'm describing here is just a process that we do in the finance profession for the last 40 years, but I do it in a machine learning way. For example, let's say my SDF is a pharma French five factor model. We know that pharma, have, uh, pharma has essentially given up on pricing momentum portfolios. So what my SDF might do here, or my, what my adversarial network might do, it might propose momentum sorted portfolios. And then I might add a momentum factor to my SDF to explain those as well. Now, finding um, optimal instruments is something that econometricians have obviously done in the past. So in the conventional GMM framework, these arguments are based on efficiency. Now, that is not going to work here. And the reason is because I have an infinite number of parameters without necessarily a normal distribution from my estimator and an infinite number of candidate instruments. So the standard arguments break down here. There's another issue that's related to identification, um, and I'm happy to talk more about this why arguments like in uh, Nagel and Singleton are not going to work here. But what we do is we use a robustness argument. We want to control the worst possible pricing error in this economy. And I argue that's the right argument 
um, if we care about identification of SDS pro SDF parameters. Are we done yet? Well, we still need to deal with the dynamics. And uh, um, the question here is how can we incorporate macroeconomic time series in our SDF model? Now note that most macroeconomic time series are non-stationary, as you know. Um, for example, here, this S&P 500 price. So what do we do? We take some form of increments. Here, I take obviously log increments to get S&P 500 returns. Now, if I just take the last period log return as an increment to my surprising model, I neglect all the dynamics. I cannot infer from last period's uh, log return if I'm in a boom or recession. I need to include all past log returns to do that. So more specifically, once we have made our macroeconomic time series stationary, we would need to take into account all the lagged increments in our model. Now, if I have hundreds of macroeconomic variables and I include all their lagged values, these are too many variables. These models are going to break down, even with regularization. And we would also ignore the time structure that's inherent in these variables. So what we propose is an LSTM framework. So an LSTM is a long short-term memory cell network and all of you have used them before, even if you're not aware of this. So LSTMs are used by Apple Siri, Android speech resignations, and Amazon Alexa. So LSTMs are great when it comes to text or speech data, which is also a time series, but we show how to use them for financial time series here. And what they're going to do is twofold. So number one, they take this large dimensional panel of uh, macroeconomic increments, and they will reduce them cross-sectionally to a small number of macroeconomic factors, then extract a dynamic state out of this time series. So it's like a combination of a nonlinear PCA with a nonlinear Kalman filter on an intuitive level. So what we are going to get out here is a small number of economic states like boom or recession. So how is it going to work? Well, this is a diagram. So given the macroeconomic time series, we extract a small number of economic states. We combine those with firm specific characteristics to get an SDF as a pricing model. Um, we have a, and we estimate the SDF to price test assets. We have an adversarial or conditional network that creates its own economic states and uses firm specific characteristics to generate test assets that we can't explain well. But now our model will learn to explain those as well iteratively, and that will be our GAN estimator. Let me come to the empirics. So we have a very standard um, um, uh, data set here, which are basically all stock returns from CRISP with 46 firm specific characteristics, 178 macroeconomic variables. We use the first 20 years for estimating our asset pricing models, five year to select some tuning parameters. The next 25 years are pure out of sample. So we're not re-estimating our model. The only reason why we capture time variation is because our input variables like characteristics or macroeconomic time series are time varying, but the function, the asset pricing function is constant that we estimate. So we compare our model with two special cases. So one special case is if you take um, our model framework, but you restrict all functional forms to be linear. So our characteristics are normalized to um, be rank, uh, um, our normalized ranks where zero is um, the median value. If you normalize everything, so if you look at the linear version of our model, you essentially end up by creating long short factors, rank sorted long short factors, and then you apply mean variance optimization to those. So the special case of what we're doing is mean variance optimization with long short factors. Because we have a very large number of factors um, to make the comparison fair, we also include um, a regularization, more specifically an elastic net penalty. So the linear special case of our model is mean variance optimization on standard long short factors with um, some uh, regularization involved. The other extreme is to take the full flexibility of machine learning, but not include an economic structure. So here we're going to use the best performing model of uh, Brian's uh, machine learning forecasting paper. And what I just want to highlight is when you do forecasting, you also estimate an asset pricing model because if no arbitrage model holds, the conditional mean, that means the forecasted return should be proportional to an SDF beta. And once I have an SDF beta, I can infer my asset pricing metrics, right? So this will be another special case. And so for these models, we are going to estimate SDFs we estimate the SDF betas, then we can run at each point in time this cross-sectional regression to get a residual 
and then we do asset pricing. So we're going to report the sharp ratios of the SDFs, the explained variations, which is essentially the squared residuals averaged over time and cross section. Or we first take the time series mean of these residuals, which gives us an alpha, and then we square those alphas and average them over the cross section. These are standard asset pricing metrics just generalized to um, this non parametric framework. So here are the main results. So please focus only on the out of sample test results. Our model is gone, this generator of adversarial network, and we get an out of sample sharp ratio monthly of 0 0.75, which is higher than the uh, sharp ratio that we get for a forecasting model, which we denote by FFN, or the two linear models, where the EN, elastic net model, is a linear model with uh, regularization. We explain out of sample twice as much variation for individual stocks, and we have around 30% higher cross sectional R squared for individual stocks. Now, one thing that um, I found interesting is that the linear factor model with regularization seems to get better numbers for this asset pricing exercise than if you do simple forecasting. And that's why I think it matters to include economic structure in this high um, noise ratio environment. Now, what matters for our model, right? We have a lot of features that come into our framework. So we want to figure out what is the importance of the different elements. Um, here I'm showing you the out of sample sharp ratio by using different features of our model. So one thing we can do is um, to take just last period's macroeconomic increments. And I just want to highlight a lot of papers just do that. If you do that out of sample, all our models will deteriorate because last period's increments are typically not that informative for an asset pricing context. And so you have just a lot of uninformative variables. So in spite of regularization, out of sample, the results will deteriorate. If you leave the macroeconomic information out, so you estimate the models only using firm specific characteristics, you get these orange bars. And our benchmark model, the one that I've shown you on the last slide is this top bar. And that's around 10% larger than if you use our GAN without macroeconomic states. So you can say there is a 10% gain from including macroeconomic conditions. Another extreme case is if I take all macroeconomic states, so I have the LSDM, but I don't do the GAN part. So I take unconditional stock returns for pricing. Mathematically, my G function is an identity. So I just want to explain unconditionally the stock return, um, uh, all the stock returns in my sample without forming these portfolios. Then I have around a 20% loss in out of sample sharp ratio. So we argue that finding informative test assets is the more important part, but both elements, economic states and informative tests as a matter to get a good out of sample asset pricing model. Now we can use our model for prediction. This comes back to the topic of the day, which is investment management, because we get SDF betas and we can sort all our stocks based on SDF betas. Um, so we can get 10 decile portfolios. And if you look at the returns of these SDF uh, better sort of portfolios in the next period. And here I show you the cumulative returns out of sample. That's after uh, 89. You see high beta has higher future returns, low beta has fewer, uh, lower future returns. And we actually have a perfect uh, monotonic relationship. So we can do prediction as well. But the focus of our model is to explain expected returns, asset pricing. So um, what I can do is I have 46 characteristics for each of these characteristics, I can form 10 value-weighted decile portfolios, which gives me 460 standard test assets. And I can look at the mean returns of these portfolios and the model implied mean return. Um, and I do this here for the GAN model. If all these uh, points would be on a 45 degree line, I would have a perfect model. I don't have a perfect model, but I get the monotonicity right. If I use a forecasting model, you see there are more characteristics for the portfolios are mispriced and the same holds if you use these linear models. So in this sense, we have better asset pricing results and we show this with metrics for all of these individual test assets. All right, now we know we have a good SDF, but what is it? Now our SDF is a time series, so I can look at correlation measures or factor spanning tests to understand it better. Um, one test could be to run a time series regression of Hamilton's high factors 
bottom line is only the intercept is highly significant and Fama French 5 is not going to span our SDF, neither will other simple linear factor models. So what does our SDF depend on? Well, we have a lot of characteristic information here. And so it's a little bit harder to talk about um, importance. So what we are going to use is an absolute gradient uh, importance measure. So if you run a regression, you can look at the slope coefficients of your regression to say which variable is more or less important. Now, what we are doing is the gradient, which is a derivative with respect to one variable, and we average it over the whole data, which is a generalization of the slope ID. And really the main point for our importance measure that we have here is that we put all our characteristics into uh, six categories, trading frictions, value, intangible, profitability, investment, past returns. And among the most important variables, all these standard categories are represented. And that doesn't need to be the case. If you do simple forecasting, the top 14 variables seem to be mainly in the trading friction and past return category. And those are the categories where you have a lot of small illiquid penny stocks. So there might be a risk that if you do standard prediction, you're overfitting illiquid penny stocks. Um, and it seems that we, it's um, our model because of the adversarial feature um, does it not. Um, we also talk about interpreting the macroeconomic states. In our model, there should be four economic states. Just to give you some high level intuition, I'm showing here the time series of our, our economic states. The gray shaded areas are NBR recessions. And if you look at the third uh, um, macro state variable that we have, it will always spike downwards right after a recession, while the fourth one will spike upwards right after a recession. So they seem to be related to general economic activity. So last but not least, that's uh, the last part I want to talk about, what is the functional relationship of our model? Now, our SDF weights are a function of a lot of parameters, so I cannot give you a plot of this very high dimensional object, but what I can do is I can fix all parameters, all variables at their median value, except for one, that gives me a one dimensional function. So I can show you the effect of size or value on the SDF. It turns out that for all characteristics, we have functional relationships that are close to linear. However, if I look at the same function for size, but among value stocks or growth stocks, so I fix another variable at a different quantile, you see that there are nonlinear effects. The same if I look at the value effect among large cap stocks and small cap stocks. So there are interaction effects that come in. I could just give you the two dimensional functional plot for size and value. The general monotonicities are as you would expect them, but there are nonlinear interaction effects. And that's what we document. And that is what we believe makes our model better than for example, linear factor models. I just want to highlight, we have tons of robustness tests. So we have results that show that our results are not driven by small cap stocks. So our results are qualitatively robust to market capitalization. We discuss a lot the choice of tuning parameters and our results are robust to the choice of the tuning parameters. Um, so it doesn't matter if we take the best second, third or fourth best model from the validation data. They're essentially all identical. And we also look at time stability. So we do a rolling window fit. We play around with the time periods the results are essentially the same. So we believe what we fit is a robust economic structure. I think I'm running out of time, so let me wrap up here. So this paper is about estimating asset pricing models with deep neural networks. We introduce some new features here. One is this adversarial idea to get informative test assets. The other one is to get economic states with an LSTM. And we bring all of this together in this GMM type framework. And we show that out of sample, we get very strong results and we can make statements about the structure of the SDF. The paper has more results, also the link to conditional factor models to the very nice work that Brian has done in that space and how that's related to our adversarial estimation approach. And we also talk about the implication to investment management. I'm going to stop here now and I look forward to your questions. Unfortunately, Thank my co-authors are not in the audience, so I couldn't reply <laughs> to yeah. your chat questions. Yeah. Uh, no problem. I'll just propose them to you right now, Marcus. Don't worry. So, yeah, Gustavo Schwenkler was asking, um, is the sharp ratio measure including or excluding fees? Well, we do it here like most other papers have done it, which means um, once you take trading frictions, for example, fees into account, the sharp ratios would be lower. 
So mm -hmm. think about the theoretical number that you could achieve as an upper bound in some way. But obviously, if you want to trade it, um, um, their fees will lower the results. Yeah, and I think I also have, I mean, Neil Stodden was uh, also kind of commenting on this. Uh, was it saying like, uh, doesn't this uh, kind of the, the, the results that you're showing towards the end of the presentation, don't those results imply that the cost of trading small and liquid stocks need to be considered uh, when you're in I, the implementation? I love this question. It is a wonderful question. It's actually related to a really great comment Brian made uh, at a conference about um, what are we trying to fit? Are we trying to fit, explain small cap stocks with our model and it, on a high level? So first of all, you can put some constraints on what the test asset should be. So you could in some way exclude test assets that might be more prone to trading frictions. And we show in the paper that this is not driving our results. But there's a bigger picture question here and that is more from the investment perspective. Um, you want to find a signal that is the most informative for investment under trading frictions. And again, so we have a section in the paper where we argue if you do asset pricing, you extract signals that are relevant for portfolio formation instead of signals that are informative for prediction. And the two don't need to be the same. But if your goal is investment, then you should actually include another penalty essentially in your model that mm -hmm. downweights in some form stocks or weights that are related to trading frictions. And we show in the paper, there's a trade-off. So we actually show how to take this into account. So it's a bigger picture agenda. If you want to do AI investment, you should extract signals that are informative for portfolio formation under trading friction. Perfect. Great thank point. you so, thank you so much, Marcus, for the great presentation. And um, let's move on to the last paper that's going to be presented by Brian Kelly. And the title is uh, maybe disturbing. Is, is there a replication crisis in finance? So, um, Brian, take it away. All right, great. Thank you, Alberto, for the opportunity. It's great to to be able to present to this audience. So this is a uh, joint work with Tice Jensen, who's a PhD student of ours and Masse Pedersen. So the, the background for this um, and this, the disturbing title uh, relates to a uh, recent and growing literature that I'm sure all of you have come across in one form or another that's essentially challenged the replicab replicability of finance research. All right. And um, actually, as Churan referenced in his talk, we're not the first field to see this. In fact, we're just one of the most recent fields to see this. It's a hugely influential paper by Ioannidis in 2005 called Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. Right, that was in the context of medical research, but you've seen this showing up in many, many research fields. All right, these challenges and the ones in finance in particular typically come in two forms, all right? So the first is what we would call no internal validity. The idea of internal validity is just that if we look at more or less the same data, the same samples, we just make little variations on the way that we conduct the analysis, the reliability of results seems to disappear, all right? Another form of this challenge has been sort of championed by people like Cam Harvey, and it's more along the lines of, we can actually replicate these results in sample using the same data, even with minor variations, but that's just because these have been in sample data mined. There's no external validity in the sense that if we go in out of sample evidence, go look at out of sample evidence, maybe internationally, maybe in the time series, that we will find a lack of ability to replicate, all right? It's closely related to the idea of p-hacking. So we have two quotes here by two largely influential and I think excellent papers in the literature. Okay, so Hoshu and Zhang mentioned that most anomalies failed to hold up to currently acceptable standards for empirical finance research. And Harvey states that most claimed research findings in financial economics are likely false, All right? So these are two very disturbing criticisms of our profession. This is the idea that we're gonna be approaching in this paper. We're gonna approach it from a different angle, all right? We're gonna be thinking about theory-based replication. We're gonna ask the question, what fraction of factor research findings are replicable? We're gonna to come to a very different conclusion. We're gonna argue that most of them are, almost all of them, 85% replicability rate when we look at our analysis. So where is this coming from? There are two pieces to our analysis. The first, and I think the most important is actually the theory-based approach that we're gonna use, all right? So we're gonna be working in a fully Bayesian model that considers factors jointly 
and has some grounding in economic theory, all right? So each of these components, the fact that it's Bayesian, the fact that it looks at factors jointly, and the fact that it has some restrictions driven by economic theory are gonna be critical to some of our conclusions, all right? It's also a benefit of looking in the Bayesian framework that we're gonna have some nice embedded multiple testing corrections. We're gonna spend some time talking about that. Next is we're bringing a new data set to the table, all right? So we're gonna look at 153 factors that we've built across 93 countries, all right? So our view is that we want a big cross country data set where all the factors are constructed in sort of an intuitive and consistent way. I want, to serve, I want this to serve as sort of a playground for a whole bunch of replication research and finance research more generally. Okay, so if you go to my website, you'll see that we've posted the code and the data for this paper. More importantly, what we've posted is code that will allow any researcher with a words account to go in and produce an international data set for every stock characteristic you can manage. Um, essentially all the characteristics that have been studied in the academic literature and a few more that we were easily able, able to create above and beyond. All right, so if I had to describe our paper in one figure, it would be this one, okay? So I'm going to start on the left. If you look at this Ho et al. paper that challenges replication in factor research, their main headline conclusion is about a 35% replication rate in their data, all right? So we're gonna use that as a, a very informed benchmark. This is an excellent and extremely, informed, uh, extremely thorough paper that these authors uh, put together. And it was really, really foundational for what we wanted to do. So if we modify our sample to some extent, and I'm gonna talk about some of the modifications that are important, we're gonna find that even if we look at the exact same types of analyses they do, which are a bunch of independent tests at the factor level, of whether or not the average raw, i.e. unadjusted returns for factors are significant, we're gonna see that in our sample, the replication rate jumps up to almost 60%. All right, where do those differences come from? They come from really minor differences in methodology. And in some sense, I think about, you know, the lack of replicability in some of these previous analyses have been driven by, I think, some, some dubious data construction choices. And I think when you make sensible, really, in our view, you know, unambiguous data construction choices, you, you see right away that even with this basic independent test, you know, here we have the possibility for multiple testing concerns and all that, even there you see a large increase in the replication rate. Now, one thing that I also would point out is that in this Ho et al paper, they include in their list of factors, some factors that were studied in the previous literature, but the previous liter literature actually found to be insignificant. So it doesn't really make sense to include those factors when you calculate a replication rate, right? It short, sort of shows up in the denominator and unduly depresses replication rates. So we're gonna kick those out of our denominator. And when you see that, of course, the replication rate rises further to 64.7%. Now, the first place where theory comes in and what we're doing is that we wanna recognize that if you wanna think about the importance, the relevance of a factor from the literature, it doesn't really make sense to be looking at the raw return, right? These have by and large been studied as violations of the cap M, right? So if we find that some of the factors in the prior literature aren't significant in terms of raw returns, but they are significant in terms of cap M, what does that mean? Well, it just means that those factors also have some market exposure that give them some risk premium that masks the anomalous behavior. Naturally, the theory tells us we just want to strip that out when we evaluate factor significance. When we do that, we see a huge effect, all right? The replication rate jumps up to 85%, very close to our headline number that we end on. All right, at this point, we're going to move into a more, more deeply theoretical model. Um, before we get there, I want to just raise the point that is related to this multiple testing literature, i.e. the work of Harvey and some others, that note that when we do these tests, we're actually not really doing the statistics right. We're treating them as many, many independent tests, and we're treating them all as one-off tests, right? Really what we should be doing is recognizing that we're con conducting multiple tests simultaneously and adjusting our inferences accordingly. So when we do that, we see that our replication rate naturally drops, okay? So we're gonna calculate the 77.3% 
off of a standard frequentist multiple testing correction that's advocated by Harvey. It's actually used by Ho et al. as well. All right. When we use this multiple testing correction, it's a false discovery rate control method. We see this drop here. It actually doesn't really change our conclusion very much about the replicability of finance research. All right. So some of these methodological choices to look at CAPM alphas, to look at some different construction of the factors, they're actually going to be robust to multiple testing corrections, even if you use the standard corrections from the literature. Note that in the Ho et al. paper, this was before a multiple testing correction. After they use the same multiple testing adjustment as a frequentist adjustment, their replication rate drops to 18%. So it becomes even a more stark failure to replicate. We're finding with the same adjustment, 77.3%. But we want to emphasize that we don't think that's the right adjustment. Right? Frequentist multiple testing adjust, adjustments um, are in some sense very coarse instruments because what they do is they sort of mechanically inflate confidence intervals. They mechanically inflate p-values. All right, And that, def that decreases the number of discoveries that you're going to find in any data set, absolutely. Um, the problem is that not only does it de decrease the discovery of false positives, it also decreases the discovery of true positives, okay? Which is these frequentist methods, they tend to seriously pay a cost in terms of statistical power. There's a lot of literature in Bayesian statistics that talks about this problem and really advocates Bayesian approaches to thinking about multiple testing. And when we do that here, we're gonna make a Bayesian multiple testing adjustment and we're gonna see that we end up at a re replication rate almost the same as the OLS-based correction. All right, we're going to talk through how that works, but it is basically a reflection of the Bayesian model is conservative because the Bayesian is going to have a conservative prior of a zero alpha. We're going to shrink towards that. That's going to decrease discoveries. But at the same time, our Bayesian model is going to have a joint structure for all factors. It's going to borrow strength from the entire data set of many different US factors as well as global factors. And this is all else equal going to have the effect of shrinking confidence intervals. So think about all our, in a Bayesian setup, all our alpha estimates are gonna be shrunk towards zero, but they're gonna be more precisely estimated. Those are essentially offsetting effects on the discovery rate. And in the end, it nets out to have a very small effect relative to the, the, the OLS-based test. The last component of our paper is to say, well, these first six bars here are kind of revisiting the US literature. What happens when we now go and look at this giant cross-section of 93 countries that we have we see that the international data largely corroborates what we see in the US. It nets out for another 0.9% increase in the replication rate. All right, so I gave um, a bit of an overview there of where our final conclusion comes from relative to the prior literature. Um, I wanna emphasize that some of this is coming from differences in methodological choices. For example, we're gonna be looking at one month holding period factors where some of the earlier literature looks at longer holding period factors. We think that one month is right because that's what the original paper always studied was one month returns. Looking at a 12 month return for a factor is not really conducting replication, right? And it's not really aligned with theory. Most theory is gonna tell you that the predictive association is about one month ahead returns. We would think of a different model for a 12 month ahead prediction. We're gonna look at sort of more diversified factors and this matters. The way we're gonna do this is we don't want small stocks to influence our results. So we like value weights, just like the Ho et al paper does. But if you use true value weights, you actually create oftentimes, and this is true, especially in the international sample, very concentrated portfolios. They're not diversified. And then your alpha estimates become wide. They have big standard errors, right? And that actually decreases the discovery rate. So if you come up with a more robust construction of the factors, their standard errors are smaller. Your discoveries become stronger. And that's a big part of where our discoveries are coming from. But we also show that our results are, are robust to just using standard value weights. There are other differences here as well. Of course, the one that stands out the most, as you saw in the prior graph, is this idea of using CAPM alpha, theory-motivated assessment, as opposed to raw returns. All right, so I'm going to go through, I'm not actually going to spend a lot of time on the full Bayesian model. What I wanna do is take you through some kind of caricature results from the Bayesian setup that I think make the important points that are relevant for thinking about replication and finance. 
So first I wanna consider a Bayesian framework where I'm just evaluating a single factor, call it F, all right? That factor has some alpha according to the cap M. All right, I have residual returns that are normally distributed and I have a prior about this alpha. This prior is gonna be normal and my conviction in that prior is gonna be governed by this parameter tau. All right, the prior is going to be that the cap M holds, i.e. the prior mean is gonna be zero. Now what happens if I calculate an OLS alpha, which I call alpha hat here, let's say from a published result. Well, I'll get some OLS alpha, but what is the Bayesian going to think about post-publication alpha? Well, they're gonna form their posterior and naturally that posterior is gonna be a linear combination of the OLS alpha and the prior mean, zero. Kappa here is always gonna be a shrinkage factor which means that when you look out of sample, right, the Bayesian expects to see an attenuation in alpha. Now there's been a lot made in the literature about post-publication attenuation in alphas, right? This is a fantastic paper by McLean and Pont Pontiff on this point. One of the important things that we wanna make is that we need to be interpreting this evidence appropriately. A Bayesian would exactly expect this type of attenuation. We'll of course have to spend some time thinking about magnitudes, but in direction, the idea would be that even if the alpha is true, the Bayesian would expect the out of sample alpha to be positive, but smaller in magnitude. And that very closely aligns with what we see in the data. All right, now let me take this Bayesian setup and enrich it kind of one step further, getting kind of closer to the empirical framework that we're gonna use. I wanna consider two related factors now. I have my original factor from the previous slide, but now I have an additional factor that shares some behavior with the first factor. I'm gonna call it a global version of the factor, just for example. So to be stark about this, I'm gonna assume that these two factors have the same alpha, right? They have different realizations, but those realizations can be correlated, much like we would see in say a US and a world X US version of book to market ratio factors. Right? Now, what we see is a couple of things. By looking at international data along with the US data, well, we're gonna do less shrinkage. This global shrinkage parameter is gonna be larger in magnitude than the US only shrinkage parameter. The basic idea is that if we have more factors, we shouldn't just be doing naive multiple testing corrections because those additional factors are informative for the conclusions about any individual factor, right? They give us less shrinkage to the prior mean and they give us smaller posterior variance about alphas, all right? So the basic point is that if we can think about this joint structure in factors, now we can use joint estimation. We can actually leverage the dependent structure in factors to form more precise confidence intervals about the alphas of any individual factor. All right, so again, I told you I was gonna take you through sort of cartoonish versions of our model. The full-blown model is gonna be more complex, all right? It's gonna be a representation of how we like to think about the data. All right, so we're gonna have many factors. The factors are gonna have different layers of similarity with each other. For example, there will be groups of factors that are thematically related to each other. So think about six month and 12 month momentum. They sort of share some similarity. There are also gonna be factors that are book to market factors, but in different countries. Those are also gonna share some similarity. We're gonna introduce this in a hierarchical Bayesian model. All right, so my alpha for any factor is gonna have a common alpha component. That's the same for all factors. It's also gonna have a group specific component. All right, this could be a component for a theme, different versions of momentum or a given factor, but across multiple countries, all right? I've written this down with sort of one layer in the hierarchy, but in the data, we actually use multiple layers in the hierarchy to consider both thematic factors and international versions of the same factor. The Bayesian framework is gonna be kind of stark about our, our prior. First, we're gonna assume dogmatically that the overall prior mean is zero. In addition, we're gonna consider that there are group specific alphas that are also mean zero, but they're gonna be shared across some, some layers in the hierarchy. And then finally, there's gonna be in what we call W here. This is gonna be the idiosyncratic alpha of a particular factor. So book to market is gonna have some overall alpha that's related to every factor. Think of it as in our interpretation, 
a way to evaluate whether the cap end is violated in general, right? And then it's going to have some theme related component. Any value factor is going to share CJ with the book to market factor. And of course, there are going to be many variants on value. And then there's going to be some individual, let's say, US specific book to market behavior. And that's captured by this last term here. All right. Now, how are we going to estimate this? And why am I presenting in a machine learning seminar? Um, we're going to be using a tool that's a workhorse in machine learning analysis. Okay. It's empirical Bayes estimation. It is really the way that modern statistics gets conducted for massive high dimensional micro, micro array types of studies. Okay, so for example, some of Marcus's colleagues at Stanford spend a lot of time thinking about empirical Bayes estimation uh, for machine learning problems. All right, the basic idea of empirical Bayes is that doing full Bayes is in fact on the table for the type of setup that we have here. But empirical Bayes is sort of a nice tractable approximation to the full Bayes problem that avoids all of the difficulties that we know show up when you try and do full Bayes integration, all right? Another way to think about the intuition is that in each of these layers of the hierarchy, an empirical Bayes is really in a, in a, intimately linked to the idea of hierarchical models. Realized dispersions of alphas within a given group tell you something about this group prior. So the data can actually suggest to you sensible prior, hyper prior parameters. Lastly, Bayesian multiple testing is really just Bayesian modeling, all right? So when you conduct Bayesian analysis, you're going to get built into your Bayesian estimation something that looks like a multiple testing correction without having to do an additional correction above and beyond your model, all right? Now, how does this work? It works because you impose a conservative prior. The conservative prior of zero alpha, whenever you do any estimation in a finite sample, is going to be pulling your estimates right toward zero. Your posterior view is always going to be conservative relative to the OLS or the MLE, and that's going to decrease discoveries. All right, that's where the multiple testing adjustment comes from automatically um, in empirical Bayes and in Bayesian, Bayesian analysis more generally. But it's also, in some sense, more powerful than. Uh, frequentist version of these types of corrections. And the reason being is because the empirical Bayes procedure is going to actually, by estimating these parameters, tell you how strong that shrinkage should be, tell you how much weight you should put on your prior versus the data. So in some, some sense, you can think about frequentist multiple testing as being sort of dumb corrections to p-values, where empirical Bayes is more smart adjustments that are data-driven. All right. I'm not, we have a ton of detail on this in the paper. So for those of you that are, that are interested in kind of the nuance of this, it's, it's pretty fascinating. I think it's very well suited for finance problems. Uh, but I'm just going to quote Gelman here and then move on. The problem of multiple comparisons can disappear entirely when viewed from a hierarchical based perspective. And we have a lot, lot additional detail in the paper to elaborate on that. All right. So let me move now into uh, the empirical results. So this is the first set of analyses that I'd show you. This is more to think about the internal validity of the paper because of the original papers, because I'm looking at just US versions of these factors now. So let's focus on the upper left. This, I've arranged the factors according from the smallest OLS estimate all the way to the highest. And we have a couple different types of factors. I mentioned we have some factors that were never significant in the original studies. I've shown them with the green bars here. Note that a lot of the factors that fail to replicate are, not surprisingly, the ones that weren't significant in the original study. We do have a non-trivial mass of red factors here. These are the ones that actually do not replicate, all right? It's a non-zero mass, but you see it's a small part of the overall sample. As you go up here, you see the blue factors. These are the ones that were significant in the orig original study and indeed replicate. Now I'm gonna transition here to the upper right and ask what happens to my inferences when I make a standard frequentist FDR multiple testing adjustment? Well, all that happens, note that the point estimates don't change when you do these frequentist corrections. The only thing that changes is you inflate the confidence intervals. And so some of these that were significant before with OLS become insignificant. Now, it's a little bit surprising to people that have read papers like, for example, by Harvey, that 
the drop in replication rate isn't bigger. Why is that? It's because we have so many highly significant factors here. It's only those marginal cases that get affected by the multiple testing adjustment. And it doesn't matter here. If you bump up your critical value from two to 2.8, you're actually not gonna see a big decrease in replication rate in the sample. Now, what happens if you use empirical Bayes? Well, you can see both the effects that I alluded to earlier. First of all, it's a little bit hard to see, but both of these, uh, sorry, all of these estimates have been shrunken towards zero relative to the OLS panel, all right? So they're essentially all shifted closer to zero, but additionally, the confidence intervals are shrunk. The confidence intervals have narrowed because now when I'm drawing inferences about any US factor in this panel, I'm using all the information I have among all US factors. And because they're correlated, they're informative for my inferences. Then lastly, in the right panel here, I again asked, what are the confidence intervals look like for the US factors but now when I condition not just on US data, but also on international data, all right? And you see the confidence intervals shrink even further. All right, so this is the first kind of evidence of internal validity of a wide range of factors that have been studied in the literature. Note that a lot of the literature has criticized replicability on the basis of size, arguing that it only happens, a lot of these effects only sort of show up in small stocks. You see that's not the case here. We break this down into five different size groupings from mega, which are every stock that's above the NYSE 80th percentile, truly huge stocks, down to nano, which is every stock below the first percentile of NYSE. And see, you see the replication rate sort of varies between you know, mid 70s to, to low 80s. We look at the replication rate by themes. You see for essentially 13 out of my, uh, for 10 out of my 13 different themes here, you see a replication rate above 75%. All right, I wanna move on now from internal validity, showing that I can basically get in sample conclusions that align with the original papers, even with all of the modifications I've made in my methodology, get in sample replicability. I wanna go out of sample now. So the first panel here, this is sort of a summary of what I was showing you for the US data before. We should focus on the orange bars here because those are our full posterior considerations, right? When we've looked at global data, if we look at a, developed XUS sample, 77.8% rep replication rate, emerging markets, almost the same. And the world as a whole, we see that 85% number. I think this is a really striking plot. If this doesn't convince you about external validity, I don't think much else will. So this is the US alpha for each factor plotted against the world XUS version of that factor. The dotted line is the 45 degree line. The slope coefficient here is 0.7. Factors that are, large and important in the US tend to also be large and important outside the US. Now I'm gonna to turn to time series external validity, all right? This is much in similar spirit to the McLean and Pontiff paper, okay? You see, like we saw in the previous plot, the in sample, i.e. the publication data alphas, align up quite closely with the out of sample alphas. This is exactly the idea. A Bayesian would expect there to be some attenuation you see on average, the alphas end up being about a third the size, uh, sorry, about two thirds the size. You see about a one third attenuation in alphas in the later post-publication sample relative to the in sample. But that's exactly what the Bayesian would expect qualitatively, right? That's coming from the, prior, the conservative prior. All right, the last thing I wanna talk about, um, I'm running late on time here. So let me just point out that the alpha magnitudes Everything I've shown you so far is about replication rates. This is about the magnitude of the alpha, all right? So the alpha ranges, depending on what theme you're looking at, between roughly 0.3% to 0.6% per month. And for most themes, that's a, that's a reliably significant positive alpha. There are a couple of themes that don't seem to replicate very well here individually. The right way to think about economic significance of alphas, though, is to actually look at a joint consideration. I've looked here at just benchmarking against the cap M, but really what we should do is sort of be benchmarking all factors against each other. That's what an investor cares about. They build a tangency portfolio of all factors. And here we see a really interesting result. This is the weight in the tangency portfolio when I consider all themes together. What we find here is that again, 10 of the 13 themes that show up in the data get a positive weight 
in an investor's tangency portfolio. This is the ex post tangency portfolio, right? It's not the in sample tangency, I'm sorry, it's not the ex ante tangency portfolio, but this is the right way to conduct the inference about whether an individual factor is important controlling for all others. All right, now given that I'm running through my time here, just wanna wrap up by saying our conclusion is quite different from this prior literature. And I think it's obviously much less dire than the private, uh, previous literature has shown. We find that there's a high degree of both internal and external validity of factors showing up in the form of this 85% replication rate. And we also think this idea of hierarchical modeling and empirical Bayes estimation is really well suited for factor research and encourage people to spend some more time looking at that. For those of you that are interested in the data, you can go to my website, which has a link here. You can go directly to the GitHub repo. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Brian. We are out of time, but there is a question from Marcus. Uh, Marcus, please go ahead. Yeah, I try to be very quick. Thank you so much for the presentation. Really fascinating paper. And I look forward to reading it. I think it just got online uh, a day ago. Quick question. So there's some work by Stefano and Da Sheng that I, I'm sure you're aware of where they also look at the multiple testing issue and they also propose corrections to, um, they have a more refined version of uh, the standard uh, multiple testing correction. I'm just wondering if you have thought about that or compared this year as well. Yeah, we've thought, we've thought about it a bit. We haven't made the direct comparison with that, but we can say more about that. That's a good point. Thanks for the suggestion. And, and just one minor point. It seems that you suggest that if you have a really smart way to do to create a tangency portfolio, then there's no need to do this multiple testing, right? Because in the end, what we need is a spanning the SDF. And if a factor is sure. contributing to spanning the SDF. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think if you, when you take a look at the paper and you take a, some look at the detail we have in the tangency portfolio section, that, that rationale I think shows up. Okay, thanks for the comments. Well, thank you very much to Marcus, Brian, and Turin for fantastic presentations. Uh, we have uh, we are out of time, so let me just remind everybody that we do not have an event next Friday. The next event is going to be Cybersecurity Day, and will take place on February 12th. And you receive an email with details uh, either this afternoon or sometime next week. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful weekend.